church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but he is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on a cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Good morning, everybody. God bless you today. We thank God for each and every one of you. We hope and pray that you are off to a great and grand start to this day that the Lord has blessed us to see. But this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. As you all are coming on, and I'm looking right here, as y'all are coming on, make sure you're exercising elementary etiquette and kindergarten kindness, saying hello, greeting the room, giving virtual hugs, and hellos to everyone today. We greet all of you from coast to coast and even around the world. We say good morning on one part of the earth or one side of the earth, and we say good evening to those of you on the other side of the earth. And we thank God that he has brought us all into this same place even though we're not all physically in the same space we thank god for that happy september y'all it's september 1st what a blessing it is to have made it this far in the year we know that there have been many trials and tribulations highs lows and ebbs and flows but the lord's grace and his goodness and his mercy has allowed us to be here one more time so i hope that you're not taking it for granted that the lord has blessed us to be together one more time there's an old song that we used to sing one more time one more time He's allowed us to come together one more time, and we thank God for that today. Hey, listen, I want to say thank you to everybody, all of you who sent gifts, text messages, emails, phone calls, salutes, your prayers, whatever it was you did to help me celebrate another revolution around the sun. We thank God for each and every one of you. Thank you so much for your kindness. People do not have to be kind, and I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And so by all means, we thank God for giving us another year. I don't take it for granted. Nope, I don't take it for granted at all. And certainly there's going to be one day that that day will not be celebrated by me on this side. So we certainly thank God for each and every one of you. Listen, we open up with a word of prayer as we always do, and then we get into our responsive reading. Uh, but a special greeting to all of our members, our CFC, you actual members of CFC. I want to pause for this cause with this station identification to say good morning to you. God bless you. We thank you so much for being with us. Also to our partners and those who support and those who watch and those that uh, may join in our broadcast, we thank God for each and every one of you to say today, and we also say a very special good morning to you. If you are watching us on Apple TV or Roku, or even if you're watching us on your screen, on your television via YouTube, we always ask that you sign into a device, make sure you log into a phone or a tablet or something, uh, log in so that you can interact with us and uh, let us know that you're watching. Also, let us know where you're watching from. If you are someone uh, that's watching from out of uh, one of our home state areas, if you're not watching from Connecticut or Texas, uh, you know, certainly let us know where you're watching from, and we certainly thank God 
uh, for each and every one of you. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. I do have a few prayer requests, and of course, we always ask that everyone, if you do have a prayer request, list them in the thread here, um, and let us know what that prayer request is. I do have a praise report as well, so I thank God for that. The prayer request, though, the prayer request, we're asking that everybody pray for the Reed family. Continue to pray for the Reed family. I think I mentioned in Bible study, uh, this past Tuesday that Dr. John Reed, Pop Reed is what we call him, Fairview Baptist Church, Oklahoma City. He transitioned on Monday and um, very dear, uh, dear to our family, very dear friends of mine, Derek and Cherie and the whole Reed family. We're just praying for them. Uh, Fairview uh, Baptist Church, great church in Oklahoma City. We're praying for that church as well uh, as we know that they are uh, contending with the bereavement of their shepherd. Uh, also, we're asking that you uh, pray for the Fagan family. Loretta Fagan, a very dear friend of my mother's, very dear friend of our family's, as a matter of fact. Uh, she's contending with an infirmity, but she's battling on, so we're asking everybody to be in prayer for her and then for her family as well, those who are uh, giving care to her and taking care of her. We ask that you pray. Uh, for the Fagan family. Then also, I just want to thank God for Angie Johnson. Uh, that's Brother Tony. Brother Tony Edwards, uh, that's his sister. Um, uh, Tony called me, and then Angie called me. Well, actually, Tony called me, and uh, he said Angie wanted to talk to me. Angie and I had a chance to talk um, a little while back. It was a while back. We kept it all under wraps, but we did ask that we would be in prayer for her. And she had been diagnosed with cancer. And y'all, I was so excited. I got to tell you, I was so excited when uh, I saw the photo of her ringing out of the cancer unit. So we thank God that he's still in the healing business. He's still uh, in the uh, caring business. He's still in the miracle business. And so uh, not only do we have prayer requests, but we also have praise reports. So I invite you to do the same. Make sure you share with us here uh, either your praise report or your prayer request, whatever it may be today. Uh, we want you to share that with us. So let's go to God in prayer and then we'll move into our responsive reading and then we'll get going right into today's worship as we dig off into the vault for a very special message I'm looking forward to bringing to you, okay? Why don't you pray with me, please? Father, we do thank you now in Jesus' name. Lord, every time I get to thank you, I, I have to pause, Lord, because if we had 10,000 tongues, we could not thank you enough for all that you've done and all that you do. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins, and Lord, we ask that you would bless us, Lord, that if we have committed anything that we should not have done or if we did not do what we should have committed to. Lord, we just ask that you forgive us, Lord. We know that you know even better than ourselves. And then, God, we tell you thank you for being a miracle-working God. We thank you for being a peace-giving God. We thank you for being a joy-sustaining God. Lord, we ask now in Jesus' name specifically that you would look upon the Reed family, look upon the Fairview Baptist Church family. Lord, we know that they are contending with bereavement, Lord, and we just know that you are still able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to that faith power that works in us. And then, God, we pray for the Fagan family, Sister Loretta. Lord, we have the praise report that you are already yet even a healer in today's time. And so, God, if it's in your will that she be healed, God, we pray that you would bless her test to become a testimony. And then, God, we pray for CFC. We pray for every member of CFC, Lord. We pray for uh, our partners. We pray for those who support the ministry, Lord. We pray for those who are part of the ministry. And then, God, we just pray for our ministry itself, God, that we will continue to be focused on just doing our part. Father, we're not in competition with anybody, Lord, but we are simply trying to complete the task in which you gave us to help share and to show and to present the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom to your people. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for today. We ask that you bless the rest of the time in which we'll be worshiping together and we'll be so careful to praise your holy name. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. And everybody says, Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you so much. I hope and pray that you, if you had a prayer request or if you 
um, had a praise report. I'll share, I hope that you share that with us today. Listen, Acts chapter number 2, verses 42 through 47 is our responsive reading. We do this every Sunday to give everyone an engagement opportunity. This gives you an opportunity, and we want you to participate. I read the red text, you'll read the black text. But we want you to participate. It seems odd. Uh, it seems almost ridiculous to some people, but this gives us an opportunity to really lock in to what we're doing today. And so if you are a newcomer, I'm going to read the red, the black text, excuse me, and I'm going to pause and you'll hear it quiet on my end while you read the red text and then we'll close out together. So it should be Acts chapter number two, excuse me, verses 42 through 47. It reads as follows. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. So continue. Sorry, y'all. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Let's close out together. It says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And the people of God said, Amen. We thank God for you uh, today and we hope and pray that you... Um, certainly took advantage of that opportunity to engage. Listen, y'all, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, oh, pray for pray for myself. Pray for the uh, other pastors and delegates that are going to be traveling. Some have already traveled yesterday. Some are traveling uh, today and then tomorrow as we all convene on the city of um, in Baltimore. The city uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, will be there for our national convention. Uh, praying for the election process. So pray for all of us that will be traveling that the Lord will bless us to not only travel there and return safely, but also by all means to handle the business of the kingdom of God. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been in the Sermon Classics series. And man, I tell you, I hope that you've been blessed. Um, I found one from 2009. It went all the way back to 2009. And uh, it's a message I preached at the Progressive Church, 1301 Pine Tree Road in Longview, Texas, some years ago. Uh, and I saw that outfit. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy. That's back in the day. But nonetheless, um, I kind of want to set it up a little bit and let you know uh, this message is entitled Ain't No Need to Worry. Um, one of the things that I do know is, is that oftentimes we fail to realize that even though we're saved and even though we trust God and even though we believe God, there are times in life that we can find ourselves still concerned about existential things. And even though we know that worry is a sin, even though we worry humanistically, we do not stay there spiritually. Um, the Bible speaks and infers about the fact that worry is a sin because it shows that there is a deficiency in our trust in God. And God wants us to trust him even when we can't trace him and when we can't track him. And so I found this message. It's two parts. We're going to play the first part of the message today and we'll come back next week and we'll play the last half of the message uh, next week. But I uh, hope and pray that you find inspiration in this message. I hope and pray that you find empowerment in this message. I hope and pray that as you all are watching, uh, share this. I'm looking at y'all. God bless you. I see y'all on here. But share this with your, your family and your friends. For anybody that may be going through or haven't gone through or may be in the middle of something, I want to remind everybody, ain't no need to worry. So we're going to drop into the sanctuary of the Progressive Church uh, 1301 Pine Tree Road back in 2009 where I'm preaching from John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10 verses 1 through 4 and then verses 9 and 11. So I'll come back after we finish the first half of this message and we'll close out with the invitation as we always do. But in the meantime, in between time, I'll hope and pray that you all are blessed by what we share today. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. Let's enjoy Ain't no need to worry. God bless you. John chapter number 10, verses 1 through 4, verses 9 and 11. Amen. When you're there, if you would indicate with a hearty amen. 
Amen. John chapter 10, and it reads beginning at verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. <clears throat> and when he brings out his own sheep, <clears throat> he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And look at this in verse nine, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except, here it is, to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have life more abundantly. Amen? Look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And this is the word of the Lord on today. Amen. You may be seated. Here it is. In John chapter 10, when we look at verses 9 and 11, I had to throw 10 in there because it makes much sense. Verses 9 and 11, we understand, thank you. We understand when we look at verses 9 and 11, we recognize here that he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture. Then he says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd, right? The good shepherd gives his life for a sheep. I want to talk this morning for just a few moments from the topic, ain't no need to worry. Uh, ain't no need to worry. There ain't no need. Now someone says that's terrible grammar. And we could say that there isn't a need to worry, but I want to emphasize what I'm saying by helping you uh, become more attentive at the grammatical usage of the terminology ain't. Ain't no need to worry. And we were talking this morning even in Sunday school and during Sunday school hour, we were talking in Sunday school and the Sunday school lesson was dealing with a hopeful people, uh, people who have hope. There is nothing worse than living a life hopelessly. There is, there is nothing, I don't, I don't know that there's anything more engaging or that there's anything um, uh, uh, anything more uh, devastating than to see someone who's living a life and they have no hope. And the second thing that is as devastating to me as relates to watching someone uh, in life is to see someone who lives a life that is filled with worry. If you're not worried about what was, you're worried about what is. If you're not worried about what is, you're worried about what's to come. And you find yourself living beneath the optimum level or the maximum level of your life because you are consumed with worry. The reality of the fact is, is that all of us we have found and discovered that in life, or as we deal with life, life has the ability to bring to you issues and situations that would cause you, unless you know God, and even if you do know God, to slip over into an arena of worry. 
with that being the case, we must understand that the word of God declares that worry, to worry basically is a sin. Because without faith, what we understand is when we don't have faith, when we don't have faith and when we find ourselves fearful, then it shows that we are not trusting God and to not trust God is a sin by itself. Here's the thing. We understand stress levels and, and maybe y'all don't know, but, but I know for me, stress levels can rise. Blood pressure can rise. Uh huh. You can have all kinds of things that take place in your life that can cause your, your nights to be filled with tossing and turning. Even as a child of God, and this is something that I think that would be uh, very necessary for us to understand, even as children of God, we find ourselves uh, in situations at times in life that just takes us uh, how shall I say, off guard, they catch us off guard, and before we know it, because of what has caught us off guard, we will take our eyes off of Christ and immediately go into, how can I fix this mode? Maybe not in here, but just me. Maybe I'm the only one like that, but, but I, I know for a fact that there are times in life when things start going awry in people's lives, whether it be our lives personally or the lives of the loved ones in which we have around us, all of a sudden we kind of get, watch me now, a God complex. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to fix this. You know, I'm, I'm going to write a check and make it go away or, or I'm going to counsel it away or I'm going to talk it away. Y'all not talking to me today, but, but because of that, it causes us to slide into a mode of worry, even though it may be covert, stealth, and subliminal. What happens oftentimes when we find ourselves worried? What happens oftentimes when we find ourselves worried? What will happen is, is that when we realize that what we are dealing with is greater than our capacity to deal with it, Woo! Say it again, MacNeil. When we realize that what we're dealing with is greater than our capacity to deal with it, then we find out that we look up and realize that we are in a mode now of discouragement. Why are we discouraged? Well, we're discouraged because we caught a reality check. We, I may have a house, but I don't have a home. Y'all not talking to me. We, we're discouraged because we got a reality check that, that no matter what medical professionals I can pay for with my insurance plan, it is not until God touches the brain or the head or the body of this individual that they will be healed. I found myself caught up in that just momentarily after service on last week when my mother shared with me what happened with Deacon Jones and then I was fine until I went in and saw him. When I went in and saw him, this big man, this big man, 6'1", six, 6'2", six, I mean just this big massive man who is normally somebody I lean on and I see him laying there nearly lifeless. I start saying, oh, man, this is beyond me. And what will happen is sometimes you'll slip into a discouragement. And see, this is what I discovered. I was sharing with someone the other day that the enemy is not interested in killing you in public. See, we, we have to understand this, too. See, he's not interested in having another public killing. Because the last public killing wound up being a fiasco. It wound up putting him down because when he hung Jesus on the cross, uh -huh, when, when, he, when he participated in the process in hanging Jesus on the cross in a, very, in a very public manner, he found out that that was the beginning of the end of his kingdom. So now he has completely turned his whole mindset and mentality and approach to warfare no longer to a public hanging. A public killing or a public murder, he's now made it very private and covert. Discouragement is one of his main weapons in his arsenal. Discouragement. You know, now you know you're not gonna be able to do that. Now, now you know, you know that's not gonna work. You know that's not gonna happen. You you know, discourage maybe y'all have never heard those voices. You know, I don't know why you're praying because I mean, I don't. You know, that boy's never gonna change his mind. 
Y'all not talking to me, huh? I don't know why you're asking God to help her. She's never going to, I mean, it's never going to happen, you know? And here's the thing. We very quickly forget on how the fact that we too were at one point in our lives in the place where others said about us what we're saying about them. Because, see, you too were at a place where you were never going to change your mind. I wish I had somebody. You too were at a place where you were never going to come out of what you were in. But because of the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous, God was able to turn that thing around. But the enemy will use discouragement as one of his main weapons. You know, if, if the last church did you like that, then the next church will do you like that. <laughs> If the last preacher was this way, then the next preacher's going to be that way. Huh? If the last experience was like that, then the next experience is going to be like that. Let me tell you what discouragement is. Discouragement is expectation that marries exasperation that gives birth to the bastard child of desperation. Yes, sir. Let me see if I can say it again. Discouragement is expectation. Your expectations are so great that you exasperate your energy to the point to where you no longer have energy to reach the, expect, to reach the expectation that you have to the point to where now you grow desperate about getting to it. Let me see if I can come another way. Watch this. Oh, pastor, I want a husband. Oh, pastor, I want a husband. Okay. You want a husband. All right. Then just wait patiently. But pastor, how long do I have to wait? <laughs> Y'all not talking to me up in it. I'm, I'm not talking about anybody. I'm just saying this is a general conversation that has happened down through the years. How long do I have to wait? Wait as long as it takes. Well, how long is that? Because my expectation is by this time I will be married. My expectation is by this time life will be at a certain point. My expectation is by this time. I will have certain things. I'm not talking to anybody here. I'm a, by this time, my expectation is this will be in place. That will be in place. And what will happen is you will spend all of your energy to try to reach that expectation only to discover that out of all of your energies, it still does not produce for you what you are expecting. So now you grow desperate. And here comes the S word. You settle. Yeah, now it goes to the fact, well, any man is better. Y'all not talking to me up in here. Ooh, but I bet there's some witnesses. <laughs> I bet there's some witnesses that, that you would say, too, that just any old thing is not better than nothing. How many of us know that it would have been better to have held on to nothing? than to put our hands on anything. Y'all not talking to me. Huh? So here it is. When we look at worry, when we look at that, we got to understand there are two days out of every week that I never worry about. Two days out of every week I don't ever worry about. Yesterday and tomorrow. I never worry about yesterday and I never worry about tomorrow. Because the reality of the fact is in the lives of Christians, we have to understand that there are situations that really take place that will cause you to be inundated with worry. A.J. Cronin says that 40% of the things we worry about never happen. 40, that's a high percentage. I don't know if you know that. 40% of the things which you worry about never happen. He says 30% of the things in the past that we worry about can't be changed by all the worry in the world. <laughs> Let me see if I can say it again. He says a lot of stuff we worry about in the past, he says 30% of those things or 30% of our worry is based on things in the past that cannot be changed with all the worry in the world. Then he says 12% are health worries, but when you have a God who says that by his stripes, you heal, that should throw that out the door. Then he says 10% of the things we worry about are just petty miscellaneous worries. That that what I what I call petty miscellaneous worries are those worries that you don't somebody say, Well, what are you worried about? Well, I don't really know. 
I'm just worried. Have y'all have y'all ever seen? You know, I'm just. I don't know what's wrong. I'm just uneasy. And let me tell you what they're doing. They're waiting to find out what that thing is they've been uneasy about, so they they can justify why they were uneasy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I know I'm worried about something. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, you just worry. Then he says 8% of what we worry about can be classified humanistically as legitimate worries. Just 8%. So when we talk human, even just humanistically, if you were going to really be worried about some things humanistically, you know, then it's only about 8%. And I would imagine one of those one of those dynamics in that percentage is the fact you need to be worried about whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Now, that's one thing. Humanistically, you need to be worried about from the standpoint of if you have not already made a decision to follow Christ, that ought to worry you. Amen? And so with that, the problem with worry is the fact that it has absolutely no power to change anybody or anything except you. That's it. It has it has no no power to change anything or anybody except you. You can worry about Joe, you can worry about Mary, you can worry about Peter, you can worry about that job, you can worry about your money, you can worry about all this other stuff. And none of those things you worry about change. The only somebody that changes is you. Stress level through the roof, blood pressure up. You know, people are worried now. How my kids gonna have Christmas? They killed me. I, I just heard on Black Friday this past week. You know, well, you know, we gotta go and get Christmas for the kids. How do you now? Now y'all help me with this. How do you go get Christmas for the kids? I, I'm just, I'm just trying to help us see something here. Yeah? How, how do you do that? And, and you're worried to the point to where you wake up at 3.30 in the morning. I can't get you up at 10.30 Sunday morning, amen? But you wake up at 3.30 in the morning to get in the line so you can go get Christmas <laughs> for the kids. That's the biggest bunch of mess. You can't go get Christmas for the kids because Christmas has nothing to do with the gifts you're getting. Christmas is about celebrating the birth of the resurrected Savior. And had we not celebrated his birth, we couldn't celebrate his death, and we certainly couldn't celebrate his resurrection and be hopeful about his return. But you know what? Good old saints, over the next four weeks, going to be worried to death. And you know what else? Can I tell you something else? Brother Kenneth, can I tell you something else? Let me tell you something else. The next four weeks after Christmas, y'all got me now, don't you, huh? They're going to be worried even more because they will have overextended themselves. Y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I'm just trying to preach a holiday season message here. They will have overextended themselves trying to make Christmas for the kids. Yeah, when we look at Hebrews, you know, 13, let's just go there right quick. I might as well use that right quick. Go to Hebrews right quick for me. Hebrews 13, and I just want to show you something right quick. Hebrews 13, and I want to look at <clears throat> at at, uh, at 5 and 6, okay? Hebrews you know, like some prescriptions, you know, they, they come in two parts. You know, prescriptions come in two parts. They, uh, you know, the two parts, they come in two parts. It's something to take and then something to do. Okay? So now, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, what it says here, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Okay, that right there throws many of us off. Being content with such as you have. You know, that, that whole I can't get enough syndrome. Okay? Be content with such as you have. For he himself has said, I will never 
leave you nor forsake you. Now, I'm talking to the saints of God today. You've got to understand the benefit of being a child of God and the reason you don't have to find yourself caught up in the worries, the woes, and the ways of this world is because you have a word from God who makes a promise that cannot be broken, and he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Can I tell you that that is going and coming? Y'all don't believe me, do you? I will never leave you, are y'all reading it there, nor forsake you. That's going and coming. Watch me now. Going, it reads like this. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Coming, it reads like this. You forsake, nor you leave, never will I. Y'all going to catch that in just a minute, boy. It's called reversing the verse. Did you see that? See, going and coming, he says he's never going to leave us. On our way there, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. On our way back, he says, you forsake nor you leave, never will I. So what are you worried about? If, if he's never going to leave you going and he's never going to leave you coming, he says, because of this, you may boldly say in verse number six, this is what I want you to see. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear or I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Now, if you ain't never had man try to do anything to you, then you can't really appreciate this scripture. <laughs> some of y'all can't say it in just a minute, but if you've ever had man trying to do some stuff to you, I'm not talking about that stuff where you didn't know they were trying. I'm talking about they sent you an email, they sent you a text. They said, yeah, we're trying to get you. <laughs> I'm talking about they sent a money gram, uh -huh, and a money gram where you had to pay for it. Y'all not talking to me. Telegram, Christmas grand. They said, they said, they let you know we are coming after you. And here the Hebrew writer says, What shall I fear? Because the Lord is my helper. What why should I fear? What what can man do to me? Here's the thing: the Lord does one of three things. He either removes the danger or he strengthens you to stand in it. <laughs> or he'll use it to help you grow in his grace. One of three things. He's either going to remove the danger or he's going to strengthen you to stand in it or he will use the situation to help us grow in grace. There are times, in other words, that God chooses not to change the situation. But he does use the situation to change us. Huh? To toughen us up. You know, it was Dr. Caesar Clark, the late Dr. Caesar Clark, Reverend Dr. Caesar Clark. Actually, he's the early Reverend Dr. Caesar Clark. I always call people who've gone on to be with the Lord. I don't call them late. They've actually gone early. Amen. So so uh, the, the early Reverend Dr. Caesar Clark uh, used to talk about uh, thank God for the rough side of the mountain. And he said, the reason I thank God for the rough side of the mountain, because if that side of the mountain was slick, I would slide back down into the valley. What gives you the ability to climb the mountain is the rugged nature of the mountain that is designed to create the friction you need for the traction you need in order to make mobile movement. Yeah. So here's the thing, you know, Lord, you know, you don't, you don't have to move the mountain. Just give me the strength to climb the mountain because I'm going to need strength when I get to the top of the mountain to know how to stay there. Huh? Here's the thing. There, there are five groups of worry, five groups of worry. And then I'm going to get into this text and I'm going to leave you alone. Five groups of worry. First of all, people worry about the past. Okay. Second of all, People worry about the future. Third of all, people.
people worry about people. Now that, that right there is a, is a whole sermon by itself. Let me tell you how people worry about people. I'm not going to stay that long because I sure could. People worry about people. People worry about people to this degree. Wonder what they're saying about me. <laughs> I mean, just, just worry. You know. Let me give you. Let me give you an example. I remember these three ladies. Boy, they were talking, 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 talking. I mean, they were talking about everybody that came through. Mm, child, mm, look at this. Mm, look at this. Mm, mm, you know. Just, mm. And whenever you get the, mm, you know something is coming. And I mean, they were talking, talking, talking. And these three sisters were talking. And while they were talking, uh, you know, they were going. It was getting late, late, late. And they kept saying, child, you know, I need to get up from here and go. Child, I need to get up here and, from here and go. And and nobody ever left. And I realized, I said, now what, now what is the problem? I said, okay, I see what's going on. See, the three women that were talking about everything. Finding deficiencies in everybody. Neither one of them wanted to leave first. <laughs> you understand? You see what I'm saying? Because they knew immediately, as soon as I leave, if the history of our activity has suggested that we talk about everybody and I am somebody, then I know I'm gonna get I'm gonna get talked about. Yeah, people worry about <laughs> they worry about people. You know, people worry about people. People worry about health. And and here's the thing about it: it's 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 a good thing to be concerned about your health, and you certainly want to be a good steward over over your body. But the reality, of the fact is, for those of us who are children of God, we understand this is not the ultimate body. So while you're sitting there eating your rice cakes and drinking your, you know, your health uh, drink and all that type of stuff, I'm going to eat a steak. I'm going to eat some collard greens. Y'all not talking to me. I'm going to eat some macaroni and cheese. I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong because I believe that you have to be concerned about the quality of your life. You must be health conscious from the standpoint to where if God is going to use you in this time, you want to be in a position where you can be healthy enough to be used. But you must also remember that you do not, regardless of what Dr. Phil, Oprah, Dr. Ian, all the rest of them with the 50 million pound weight loss challenge and all that type of stuff, regardless of what they say, you will not change the clock. The quantity of your life is still set for an appointment. So here's the point I'm making. While you are concerned about your health, you don't need to worry about your health. Not as a child of God. Because here's the thing. Your new body will be disease free. Watch me now. This is, this is a good one right here. Many of us ought to be able to shout on this. Your new body will be fat free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your, your BMI, your body mass index, it'll be just what you thought it ought to be. Everything will be just fine. So, so you not worry about that. And the, that, that's the fourth thing. And the fifth thing, people worry about finances. Worry about finances. And that is so unlike what God wants us to do. Here's the thing. Why are you worried about finances when every day the responsibility for you to be taken care of rests on him? Give us this day our daily bread we get caught up in what the economist of today's society says about you know laying away and of course there are great financial plans out there and i'm a proponent for that but at the same time even in our in our sunday school lesson this morning at the same time i think it's very important to know that you should never be so concerned about something on this side that you're unwilling to leave it when you when it's time to go to the other side Amen. Your house should not be such a house that it's a castle that you just don't want to leave. Man, I will shoot the deuce. Did you hear what I said? I mean, it, it, your car should not be such a car that, you know, you, have to, you want to drive it to heaven if you can. The point I'm making here, out of all five of those groups, those are the five groups that we find ourselves most attached to. And because we are most attached 
See, those five groups, those happen to be the same five things that we find ourselves worrying most about. And the Lord says, I trump all of them. I trump your past because I'm the God of yesterday. I trump your future because I'm the God today and the God forevermore. He says, not only that, I trump the people in your life. Because the people in your life were created by me. I created you for the people in your life. I trump your health because I'm going to give you a body that will never see sickness again. And I trump your finances because the place I'm bringing you to is a place that is so priceless that it's been said the streets are made with gold. Did y'all hear what I said? Now that must be some place when the streets are made with not paved <laughs> see if it was paved that just mean to be like some of our jewelry y'all not talking to me right quick but anyway you know see uh yeah yeah you can't go swimming in it <laughs> y'all not saying nothing to me but but here's the thing when the streets are made with gold you know you have you know liquid Our walls of, of onyx and sapphire and jasper and, and diamonds and emeralds and, and all types of uh, amethyst and all types of pearls and gems. Why are you worried about your finances? He says, listen, these five things you need not worry about. I took care of you in your past. I'm going to take care of you in your future. How do I know that? Because I'm taking care of you in your present right now. Okay? I'll take care of the people. If anybody wants to come after you, I want you to know that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I take care of your health. How do I know? Because listen, if you are sick, the Bible says, call on the elders. They shall lay hands on them and they shall recover. I take care of your finances because look at this. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. I have the cattle of a thousand hills. Can I tell you what's so good about making sure that you understand that God is able to take care of all of your needs? Not only does he have the cattle, of a thousand hills, but he has the hills that the cattle own. <laughs> God bless y'all today. Lord have mercy. Ain't no need. Ain't no need to worry. We thank God for you today. I hope and pray that you were blessed by part one of what we have shared. And as I was watching that, and just kind of watching you all come in and chime in with your various uh, interactions. Listen, there's no need to worry. We thank God for blessing us with the opportunity to know that he is real, that he is true, and what a blessing it is to know that our God is able to take care of our needs. Listen, as we get ready to close out right quickly, I do want to extend this invitation. I see you all. God bless you today. I hope that you have been blessed by what's been shared today. The invitation screen is up. And I want you to really think about the fact that we serve a God. Y'all, He has it all. He has our health. He has our wealth. He has any and everything in which we need to not only survive in this life, but also thrive in this life. But you gotta have a relationship with him to really thank God for what he can do and what he does do. So if you're with us today, the invitation is being, is being extended. Salvation, restoration, or connecting. You see there, you can email us or you can text us. And certainly by all means, we will respond to whatever your desire is. We're going to ask God's blessings upon this time. If you are in a place of decision, it's my prayer that you would expeditiously make that decision for Him. Because I know for a fact you cannot go wrong trusting and believing in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For what He's already done is more than enough. And certainly he was willing to die for us on Calvary's hill and to supply us with the greatest need. Supply our greatest need, supply our greatest desire. Then he can do that existentially 
because of what he's already done eternally. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you now. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for this word today. We pray that someone has been blessed. Lord, we pray that someone has been inspired, uplifted with this first part. And to remind us, Lord, that it really is no need for us to worry. Thank you, God, that you've handled all of the business that needs to be handled eternally. And as sure as you've handled all the business that needs to be handled eternally, Lord, we know that you will handle all the business for us existentially. And now, God, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would bless us, that as we move forward throughout the rest of this day and even this week, that you would keep us in your care and remind us that there is no need to worry. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. Everybody says amen. I hope you'll make a decision today for Christ. God bless you today. We certainly hope and pray that each and every one of you are looking forward to, to what God has in store for you today and what God has in store for you for the rest of your life to live out in his power, in his privilege, and in his purpose. God bless you, everybody. Have a fantastic Sunday. We pray that you have a safe week. Join us Tuesday night. We're getting in on the action. We'll be right back. And on the action Tuesday night, make sure you share this with your family and friends. Listen, we're closing out as we always do with the doxology of the day. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of the Lord with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. But I want y'all to also just type this. Don't worry. God bless you, everybody. Let me see y'all type that. I see you. Don't worry. God bless you, everybody. Happy Sunday. Until Tuesday night, the Lord says the same.